back. John Herman here with you 20 minutes past the hour. And uh, Dennis in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Hey, Dennis. Happy Anything Goes Friday. What's up? Hey, Tom. How are you? Um, I'm my well. My question actually is about uh, supply-side economics. Uh, I understand the criticism that it increases uh, income inequality and it fails to generate the promise of uh, government revenue through uh, economic growth. My question to you is what are your biggest uh, issues with it? Or trickle-down? Well, the supply-side economics is a scam. <laughs> I mean, that's my biggest concern about it. If you go back and you read, uh, you know, Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith's book, actually his book Theory of Moral Sentiments is an even better book, um, you know, about the deficiencies of capitalism. But basically both of them point out in both those books that what produces uh, wealth for the nation, what produces, um, you know, a strong middle class, although that's not a phrase that Adam Smith used, but... But, uh, you know, social stability is a result of general wealth among working people, um, which is a paraphrase of, of things that Adam Smith actually said, mostly in theory of moral sentiments, um, is, is, uh, is wages. And wages are what drive demand. And wages, in fact, are so much drive demand. In other words, if you have money in your pocket, you go out and buy things. When you buy things, the companies that sell those things have to buy more of them. The companies that manufacture things have to make more of them. The companies that manufacture those things have to hire people to make those things, uh, or they have to buy more robots to make those things, in which case the robot manufacturers have to hire people to make the robots, you know, whatever. That you having money in your pocket is what drives the economy because it drives demand. And, and, and that's so much the case that economists don't refer to wages as wages. They refer to wages as aggregate demand, right? The sum of all the demand in the economy is the sum of all the wages in the economy minus uh, basic living expenses like rent. So, uh, you know, that's that's been our understanding. You, that's, you know, uh, Adam Smith, 1776, Wealth of Nations. Um, 17, I think it was 1781, he published Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, then you go to David Ricardo, uh, 1809. David Ricardo, one of the great economists, uh, his Iron Law of Labor, and his, uh, and his uh, iron, or uh, maybe it was called the Iron Law of Wages, but, um, and and he also wrote extensively on the impact of immigration, diluting labor pools, and the impact of, of, of unions. And David Ricardo pointed out the same thing. Wages are what drives the economy. Now, that was always believed to be the case. That was known to be the case. There's a million examples of that. Uh, probably the best example is how Franklin Roosevelt got us out of the, out of the Great Depression. John Maynard Keynes said, if you hire, and, and the way that FDR did it was he put millions of people back to work, plan planting trees, building dams, uh, you know, just doing some things that were really, really productive. Other things, you know, hiring painters, I mean, the artists to do things like all the art that's in the Detroit, uh, Muse the Detroit Art Institute right now, which is just mind-boggling. So, you know, he put these people to work and gave them a paycheck. That paycheck then got us out of the Great Depression because it produced demand. And right. so, you know, that, I mean, that, that's just like... You know, Econ 101, right? And that everybody always understands. So what happened in, in 1980, in the early 1980s, in the, in the early Reagan administration, was they wanted to come up with a rationalization for massively cutting the taxes on rich people. And so the theory was, if we cut taxes on rich people and on businesses, they, you know, because when Reagan came into office, fully one-third of all federal receipts, all the money that supports all of, you know, this is the reason why Eisenhower was able to build the National Highway system, why during the Eisenhower administration we built thousands, tens of thousands of new schools, new hospitals, new roads, bridges, airports, all kinds, you know, and most of this infrastructure we're still using from the 1950s. The reason he was able to do this, one third of all the income was coming from corporate taxes. But they wanted to radically cut those corporate taxes and radically cut the taxes on the billionaires, and they had to come up with a rationalization for it. And so the rationalization they came up with was, if we cut taxes on these guys, they will produce more goods. They'll run their factories, you know, they'll be able to use that money to hire more people, expand their factories, and produce more goods. Now, 
why would that be a good thing if demand comes from wages? They're not talking about increasing wages. So by, you know, by any measure of classical economics, literally from Aristotle through Adam Smith through John Maynard Keynes, and we were still in a Keynesian economy in 1981, um, by any rational, you know, that, that should be a completely meaningless and BS argument. So they came up with a new argument that said, well, if manufacturers manufacture more stuff, if there's more more stuff on the shelves of the stores, then people will buy more stuff because it's available. If there's more supply, there will be more economic activity. And so instead of demand side, you know, the demand side driving e the economy, they said these brilliant, you know, the, 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 the Stephen Moore was actually one of the big proponents of this said, well, actually it's, it's, it's supply side. We've got we've to incentivize the job creators and the, and the billionaires and the big corporations by cutting their taxes and they will make more goods and that more goods flooding our stores. And this is also the rationalization that they use for opening the door to China. Cheap Chinese goods coming into the United States, there's more stuff. Walmart is filled with more stuff than they had before. It's all made in China, but it's cheap, and therefore that will stimulate the economy. Now, 40 years on, we can look back and say, say this was complete BS, but that's, that's the history of it, Dennis. Right. Um, so you disagree that um, you don't believe it's the increase in supply of goods that leads to lower prices that stimulates um, demand. You believe it's wages, correct? Could you, um, By and large, there there are obvious exceptions to this, Dennis, and the, and the main one is uh, innovative technology. You know, when Apple, when Steve Jobs developed the iPhone, he created a supply of something that didn't exist before, and therefore there was demand for that. But that demand could not have been met if people didn't have the wages to be able to afford the iPhone. So in a way, it still points out the supply side is nonsense. Obviously, innovation is going to stimulate the economy, just like, you know, the invention of the Internet did, just like the invention of the um, so, Dennis, that's, that's the story. I hope it's of value to you. We'll be right back. Coming up on 28 Minutes. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 202-808-9000.